Trial evidence is both more complicated and far less complicated than many practitioners would have you believe. The reality is, is that when it comes to the laying of foundation, the basis for the admission of testimony, there are really only five core issues. We're gonna walk through each of those, and we're also gonna talk about the four different types of evidence and the magic words that you need to use in order to get them admitted. For purposes of getting an exhibit or even getting testimony in, here are the five core words that we're, we need to be looking at, or the five core issues that we need to look at. The first is relevance. You're offering this particular piece of information, of testimony, or this exhibit, you're offering it for a particular purpose. And the relevance drives the train. It determines the reason and the foundation that you ultimately have to, to lay. But of course, it has to actually be relevant to the dispute that the relevance of it can change the nature of the foundation. So as an example, if you have a document, a memo, and you're offering it to show that what's written in that memo is true, that's a different kind of foundation than if you're simply offering it to show this witness read this and was aware that this information existed. And, in, and that's also very different than this witness wrote this, whether it's true or not. And so that's an example of how the relevance can change the nature of the foundation that, that is needed. Relevance is, of course, driven by Evidence Rule 401 and, of course, 403. And uh, we'll be talking quite a bit about 403 and the balancing test that exists there later. The next issue is authentication. Now, authentication is what people normally are talking about when they say foundation. And authentication is kind of misunderstood. In, in a very real sense, it's a very low bar for admission because authentication is simply that we have some evidence that this thing, this document, this exhibit, that it is what it purports to be. Most of the time, under Evidence Rule 901, authentication is established by a witness with knowledge. The witness knows was at this particular spot and knows that this particular photograph actually um, act fairly and accurately depicts what that scene looked like. So authentication or that this is in fact the contract or this is the email or this is the uh, blue magic marker or the knife or the Coke bottle. So authentication, it's actually a relatively low bar, but it tends to freak people out a little bit when they start talking about the either foundation or authentication. The next issue is hearsay. And hearsay is, again, one of the most um, cited, most one of the most misunderstood, and of course, one of the most complex rules as it relates to the admission of evidence, whether it's testimony or an exhibit. For our purposes, we need to start with the proposition that hearsay ultimately consists of two things, and you have to have both of them. That there is an out-of-court statement of some form that was made. It could have been made by this witness, could have been made by somebody else, could have been a report that was written, could have been a videotape, but there's a statement that's being made. And what is in the statement is being offered to prove the truth of what was said. Okay, So if you have an out-of-court statement, but you're not offering to prove the truth, it's not hearsay by definition. If it is being offered to prove the truth, then it has to fall within one of the exclusions or one of the exceptions. And the exclusions you'll find in 801, and the exceptions you'll find in 803, 804, and 805. We'll spend more time talking about those. The next issue that you need to be prepared to deal with is what's called the best evidence rule, and it's horribly misnamed because there actually is no rule that requires that a lawyer must offer the very best evidence. That rule does not exist. The best evidence rule is actually more properly called the original document rule, and it essentially stands for the proposition that if you're going to offer a document, if you're going to offer a piece of documentary evidence, well, you should offer the original. And then it goes on to define as a original an electronically reproduced copy. So it could be an email, you know, something transmitted, something scanned. It could be a photocopy. It's really a rule against changing the original and not offering a, an original that's been marked up or has marginalia on it. 
And there's some other nuances of the best evidence rule, which you'll find in the 10 hundreds of the evidence rule. And I encourage you, it's a short read, I encourage you to buzz through those real quick. And you can see it includes things like document summaries and some other ways of getting evidence in. But at the core of it, the best evidence rule is simply the original document rule. Finally, the fifth issue for us to be aware of is one, we call it privilege because it includes privilege, but it also includes things like the, the, the parole evidence rule, which can't offer external evidence uh, on a contract. It includes the dead man statutes and things along those lines. Um, the operative rule here is that you don't see it very often, but you kind of know it when you see it. Generally, we're going to be dealing with those four top issues. Relevance, which drives the train, because that's going to determine what the nature of the, how you're going to authenticate it, how do you show that this thing actually is what you're purporting it to be. Hearsay, are you offering to prove the truth? Is it, is it a statement at all? Does it fall an exception? And of course, the best evidence rule. So those are the five evidentiary issues. But now let's talk about the four types of evidence. So those are the five evidentiary issues you got to cover when you're laying foundation. When you're dealing with different types of evidence, there's really only four types of evidence. There's testimonial wit, uh, wit evidence. That's a witness testifying under oath. And that is a witness that has to be competent. They have to have knowledge about the thing that they're testifying about. They can't just be making stuff up. And so there, the key and the buzzword is knowledge. Does the witness have knowledge of the thing that they're testifying about? And so there we might ask questions like, well, what's your familiarity with X? Or, well, how do you know about Y? Or when were you at uh, this location? Things along those lines help establish the witness's knowledge base so that they can then testify because they, we've established that they have that knowledge base. There's documentary evidence, and that can be things like contracts, checks. It can be uh, police reports to the extent that police reports are ever admissible. Um, it can be things along those lines. And here the phrase is that this document is authentic. It is what it purports to be. Take another look at Evidence Rule 901, authenticity, but also take a close look at uh, Evidence Rule 1001, the best evidence rule. And that's where this phrase comes from, that this document is a true and correct copy. It is a true and correct version of. And that's where that phrase comes from, true and correct. Real evidence covers a relatively large, uh, large area. It includes diagrams, it includes photographs, uh, and it also includes things like, you know, blue magic markers. It includes bottles and bats and knives and guns and uh, other things, shell casings and things along those lines. It includes, you know, the stuff, the sort of the mainstream stuff that we want might want to admit. If we're dealing with a physical thing, the buzzword here is identity. This is the thing. And it is in the same or substantially similar condition. And if it's not in the same or substantially condition, we need the witness to explain what's the difference before the judge is going to allow the jury to take a look at it. If we're dealing with a depiction, a photograph, a diagram, and again here, is it being offered as a scale diagram? Well, then we're going to have to authenticate it that it's the scale. But if it's just being offered to show general relationships, if it's a photograph that's showing what the scene looked like on that date, then there, the magic words that should come from your mouth are a fair and accurate depiction. And it has to, of course, be specific to that particular day. Now, a lot of times, especially with photographs or with diagrams, people say, oh, well, we need the person who actually took the photograph, or we need the person. And in our system of justice, we do not. The nature of foundation for a photograph is essentially this. I was there, it looked like that. And that's essentially the, the, the totality of what's needed for a photograph to be entered into evidence. Now, there may be relevance issues. There may be 403 prejudicial effect versus probative value issues. But for purposes of laying the underlying foundation, the in terms of what it is and to get it in, the key issue here is identity. Finally, we have a category of, of evidence that's illustrative or uh, demonstrative. It's being offered to help the witness explain something. So as an example, if the 
uh, issue is that the, um, the, 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 the victim had a big Coke bottle in their back pocket when they were attacked and they pull it out and whack the, uh, whack the defendant. Um, do we need the actual Coke bottle or is it sufficient that we have a Coke bottle that is of s s similar size? Uh, and here, the, the issue is, will it help clarify? Will the document and, or a diagram help the witness explain? Is there a simulation or something that will help the witness explain? And that's the key element here. And that's the buzzword that would come from your mouth. You would ask the witness, will X help you explain your testimony to the finder of fact? Now, there is one thing you need to know about illustrative and demonstrative doc, uh, exhibits. And some jurists, some judges draw a distinction between the two, between illustrative and demonstrative exhibits. Uh, and for purposes of the way in which they're treated after they're admitted. Generally, a demonstrative exhibit, something that happens inside the courtroom or is created inside the courtroom, it may be marked as an exhibit, it may be showed to the jury, um, and even they say like an, a not to scale diagram, if you fall back on it's only being offered for demonstrative purposes, if it comes in only for demonstrative purposes, generally it will not be shown to the jury, but it will not go back to the jury room deli during deliberations. So be aware of that if you decide, say you, you cannot establish for whatever reason that it falls into the category of real evidence, be aware that if you slide down into illustrative or demonstrative, you run the risk that that exhibit may not actually go back to the jury during the deliberations. You get to see it, they just don't get to take it back there with them and consult it. So, so those are the buzzwords that you need to be aware of, and those are the five evidentiary issues. Good luck.